All right, so welcome everyone to this Potter webinar on the 4064 conventional fire alarm panel. Hope everybody's having a uh, decent Tuesday morning so far and it's bright and sunny and uh, no rain's coming your way. Get this started, little introduction about myself. So my name is uh, Tony Moore, uh, located here in the St. Louis metropolitan area. Uh, been in the industry for actually going on 17 years now. Uh, started out in the field installing, did that for roughly eight years, then uh, went to work for a engineering firm designing fire alarm systems. Uh, did that for a few years. Potter got a hold of me and said, hey, why don't you come over and uh, head up our training department? Uh, so been here for going on five years now, and it's uh, been a pretty good experience. Uh, I know this COVID-19 has been a test for, for us as far as a lot of remote training and trying to figure things out and I'm sure it's been a test for you guys as well. I do want to say before we get started though, if you guys have any questions at any time, please feel free to type those into the chat box. Uh, I will try and answer those during the presentation and if I don't get to those during the presentation, I will get to those at the end of the presentation. So again, we're going to be talking about the 4064 uh, conventional fire alarm control panel. This webinar should take roughly 45 minutes to an hour, uh, depending on questions. So a little overview of this panel. It comes with uh, six conventional or IDC circ IDCs, uh, initiating device circuits. Uh, so this is six class B or three class A circuits. So again, six class B or three class A. Expandable to 192. Now I will say, if you guys are looking to have 192 conventional circuits, uh, hopefully you're not doing 192 and you're looking at putting in an addressable fire alarm control panel at that point. Uh, that's a lot of conventional circuits. Uh, it does have built-in 5 amp power supply, so it's actually a lot of power for a little conventional panel. Four notification circuits. These notification circuits can be programmed multiple ways, and we'll cover that as we move forward throughout the presentation. Uh, but as far as sync protocol, we do have built-in sync for Gentex, which is the Potter, uh, Amseco, System Sensor, and Wheelock Appliances. We also have QuadraSync for all those, so all four of those will work on the system, of course, and sync up system-wide. This panel comes with one programmable AUX power circuit. Uh, with this, you can use it as door holder power, constant power, resettable power, multiple ways to use that aux power circuit. Four configurable relays. Uh, the relays are programmable, uh, meaning that you can use them for alarm, trouble, supervisory, water flow. Uh, again, multiple ways to use those relays. And we'll cover that uh, throughout the presentation as well. It does have our typical Potter link or the P-Link, uh, that RS-485, uh, and it will support up to 31 system accessory cards. Uh, those accessory cards can be anything such as a smart power supply, maybe those additional IDC cards, uh, which is the IDC-6, uh, or even relay cards. So there's multiple ways to use accessory cards on the system. And the nice thing is any accessory card that works with our addressable control panel will work with this 4064. Uh, Built-in Ethernet port, which can be used for uploading or downloading the uh, software configuration file, but it's also a UL-listed IP communicator. Uh, nice thing about this, it's a sole path, uh, or I should say it's listed as a sole path communicator uh, in accordance with NFPA 72. It also has built-in email capabilities. Uh, so as far as all the email capabilities that our addressable fire alarm control panels have, this conventional one has the same options. And I apologize if you hear my dog whining in the background. Uh, he's, he's needy at times. Uh, that's the perk of doing some of this at home. Uh, so question here. Can this 4064 work with the addressable devices? Uh, so no, it cannot work with the addressable detectors and modules. It only works with the P-Link modules. I 
does have a 4x20 character display and, of course, your typical system status LEDs. You know, for your power, ground fault, the I should say the infamous ground fault. Uh, everybody loves that uh, LED. Uh, supervisory trouble, alarm, etc. cetera. Uh, again, like I said earlier, it can be programmed via a laptop or you can program it via the keypad. Now, here at Potter, we strongly urge people just to use the laptop to do the programming. Uh, the reason why we do that is because uh, within tech support and people calling into tech support, we have several people that try and do it through the keypad, but unfortunately in the keypad, you can only see a few options at a time. Oops. Uh, so with that being said, people make mistakes. However, if you have the software file open, you can see everything right there on your computer. Now, of course, in a pinch, if you don't have your computer, computer's not working, something to that nature, yeah, program it via the keypad. But otherwise, I'm going to say program it via the laptop all day long. So what we're going to cover through this, of course, we did the little overview, is installation of the 4064 control panel, the accessory cards. So these are the cards that work with both the conventional panel and the addressable control panels. Uh, typical panel startup, a uh, little over, overview of programming. However, we don't get into detail of the programming uh, in this webinar, and that's because we have our software webinar. Uh, so if you know the software for the addressable control panels, you're going to know the software for this 4064. Uh, PCOM network capabilities. Uh, so as far as reporting, again, to the central station, uh, how to upload and download, things like that. And again, if you guys do have those questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box. So first up here is the typical panel installation of the 4064. As far as cabinet installation, make sure you mount it to an interior wall. If you mount it to an exterior wall, have a vapor barrier in between, uh, just due to con condensation. Uh, you know, if you live in a high humidity area and you mount it to a concrete wall, those walls are gonna sweat. And of course, the sweat gets on the panel, et cetera may short something out. So again, we, we recommend mounting to an interior wall, but if you mount it to an exterior wall, make sure you have a, a vapor barrier in between. Uh, operating temperature 32 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, not to exceed 85% humidity. Uh, make sure the panel's properly grounded, of course. And then typical dimensions of our control panel are there. If you've ever worked with our uh, smaller little releasing panel uh, it is the same cabinet as that also it's the same size cabinet as our other conventional panel the 6006 uh, so that's a nice thing too so if you ever had an issue with that uh, you could swap some things out if necessary again this one does not do releasing but it just uses the same size cabinet as our small releasing panel Here's a look at our board. And we're gonna start out talking about some of these terminals going around the board. First terminal we have here is that PCOM network connection. Again, this is how you're gonna upload and download to and from the control panel. It's also how you can utilize the email capabilities of the control panel or send signals to the central station via IP. You have your aux power circuit. This is rated at one amp. Again, it could be used for door holder power, resettable power, constant power, multiple ways to utilize the aux power circuit. Then you have your six IDC or initiating device circuits. Again, this is six class B, or it can be three class A circuits. Uh, these are uh, listed to work with two wire smoke detectors. Uh, so again, you can put two wire smoke detectors on these circuits. Most times people ask, you know, what two wire smoke detectors are listed. I don't get into detail about that, but the only thing I do tell people is the fact that the, yes, the system sensor 2WB does work with this. Uh, since that's like the number one conventional smoke detector utilized nationwide. Then you have your notification circuits. You'll notice there's also a box up at the top with the reference EOL. That confuses people at times because they see that reference EOL terminal next to the IDC 
and they think it's for the input circuits. That's not the case. The reference EOL is actually for the notification circuits. By default, we use a 5.1K end-of-line resistor. However, with the reference EOL, you can change this between 2K to 27K. Again, default is 5.1, but you can use a reference EOL from 2K to 27K. A uh, good question here as far as a specific enunciator. Uh, does it use a specific enunciator? Can you use the RA6075? So it does not use a specific enunciator. You can use the 6075 or you can also use the 6500, uh, which we'll see here in a little bit. Uh, preference for me, I would say, because the 6075, if you look at a lot of, a lot of codes, uh, especially breaking down to jurisdiction, they say that the remote enunciator has to mimic the display or be greater than the display of the fire alarm control panel. So if you were to use that 6075, uh, it probably wouldn't comply with a lot of uh, local codes or even national codes because it's a four, or, or sorry, that one's a two by 16 character display and this is a four by 20. Uh, so I would say if you're gonna do it, use the 6500. And also, the other reason to use the 6500 enunciator is the fact that it's actually cheaper than the 6075. So the larger one's cheaper than the smaller one. Uh, so the P-Link, the Potter Link, uh, typical RS-45 connection with your uh, plus minus A and B. Uh, one thing that confuses people, if you come from other manufacturers, a lot of people think when connecting this, that you have to cross over the A and B for communication. That's not, that's not the case. It's simple A to A, B to B. I will talk about that more as we get to the P-Link modules. Again, the four programmable relays, uh, you'll see here that they are all form C contact relays. That's something that Potter standardizes on, which is pretty nice. Uh, so when we say we have a relay, it's always gonna come in a form C contact or form C. Uh, with that being said, again, these can be programmed for trouble, supervisory alarm, water flow, uh, and mapped to with certain inputs. Uh, so that's even the better part about this is the fact that you can map it to where, okay, if IDC3 activates, it activates relay two. Then your battery connection. So as far as the battery connections, uh, biggest thing I tell people about this is when you're doing annual test and inspection, you should see 27.3 volts, and that's with or without a load. So with the batteries connected or disconnected, you should see 27.3 volts on those battery terminals. If it starts to dip down to the 26s, 25s, uh, doesn't mean that it's necessarily not working. It's just something is probably going wrong with that charging circuit. So we always tell people to take note of it. Otherwise, I mean, it's normally right on 27.3 on the dot. And then of course your four by 20 character display. And another question here, can we reset the panel through the IP communicator? And the answer is uh, uh, no. Uh, so uh, there, there's no way, so yeah. And this is something I could talk about. We do have other softwares available. So, by default, we'll say there's no way to reset the panel through the IP communicator. But if you're utilizing like the PotterNet software or maybe even the 46, or sorry, the FMT software, uh, there is a way to be able to reset through there, but there's a liability waiver you have to sign because according, you know, in accordance to NFPA 72, you, you're not supposed to be able to remote silence and reset. Uh, so if we unlock those features, we make you sign a liability waiver for your company, for your customer, everything else. So that way nothing's on Potter. Uh, but normally I'll tell you just, I would not try and reset through the network.
Uh, the other thing about these six IDCs, they do come pre-programmed uh, in the Class B format. I just bring all this up here. So you'll notice the water flow for input one, smoke for input two, uh, the pool for three, and then of course your tamper switches for input six, and the fire alarm for four and five. That could be we just put them as kind of generic. That could be your heat detectors. Could be really anything. Uh, we do get a lot of people. It's it's kind of humorous. We think that call into tech support, and they will they will call us and say, "Hey, I need to make a programming change, and I want uh, you know my water flow on input five, and my smoke on input one, and pull station on input four, etc." And a lot of times we ask them why, like why not just took it up the way it's pre-programmed and it's less work for you guys in the field. And sometimes they argue, and so we show them anyway, but. Again, if you're doing a small little sprinkler uh, monitoring panel, kind of like what's pre-programmed here, hook it up the way that it's shown here on the screen and you shouldn't have as many issues. All of your zones are configured for you. I mean, pretty much everything's done besides setting up your reporting. So the only thing you'd have to actually get into the control panel and do is set up reporting to the central station. Again, a 5.1K EOL. Uh, conventional zones programmed as Class A. So if you were to make this Class A, this is how it'd be kind of programmed. So uh, you could have water flow. You'll notice that input one and input two are your Class A loops, three and four, and then five and six. Now, if you make this Class A, this does not mean this is how it's actually going to be in the program. This is just for demonstrational purposes. So uh, again, your pull station could be your Class A loop on zones one and two, water flow for three and four, et cetera. And as, as always, remember that when you do a class A system, no end definer resistor is required. Zone settings are really the input settings for those IDCs. So you notice we have multiple input settings from pull station all the way down to HVAC restart. And HVAC restart is really for New York City HVAC restart. Uh, but majority of what you're probably going to be using is the pull station water flow supervisor and tamper. Uh, but the other nice features that we do have here, if you did need them, you could set up uh, input to disable your output. So you'll see the contact input disable outputs. So you could disable all your NACs. Maybe you wanted to hook up a... Uh, uh, switch or something like that and disable all of your notification. You could certainly do that pretty easy with our system. Output configuration. So again, default 5.1K, but it can be programmed from 2, 2K to 27K using that reference EOL. Uh, power is supervised and regulated. Will reverse polarity upon activation, of course and can be configured as any of the following, from constant power, resettable power, door holder power, to your sync circuit, uh, again, which is the uh, Gentex system sensor, wheel lock, and uh, Amseco. And then, of course, city tie for any of those people on here that are actually in those areas that still utilize city tie. Uh, for you guys that are not in those areas of city tie, yes, there's still a lot of municipalities that utilize city tie. Output sync features, like I just said, you know, selectable sync for MCCO, wheel lock, Potter, Gentex, or system sensor. And again, we have that capability of utilizing QuadraSync. So all four of those manufacturers will work on this system uh, or on this system wide. Now, while they'll work system wide, they, knew they do need to be on separate circuits. Uh, so you notice here we have NAC1 for system sensor, NAC4 for wheel lock, and then of course NAC2 for Gentex. Again, they will have to be on separate circuits. Uh, as far as sync protocols via the keypad, so another question here. Uh, yes, you can program the sync protocols via the keypad. Uh, so when we say it's fully programmable via the keypad, it, it literally is fully programmable via the keypad, uh, which makes it nice. Uh, but again, I strongly recommend just programming via the, the software, uh, just so that way you can actually see everything you're doing all at one time. 
As far as relay programming, again, program this for low AC, multiple ways to do this. It is rated at three amps at 24 volt DC and three amps up to 125 volt AC. Uh, so pretty stout relays there. Aux power programming, again, as mentioned earlier, it's rated at one amp and can be programmed for resettable power, uh, door holder power, constant power, which is the default. You'll notice there's two different door holder power options. Uh, the difference between these is the fact that the standard door holder, if you lose AC power, will stay on the whole time, which means your battery calculations are going to be very, very large. If you choose aux door holder low AC, uh, you have an option in the software to drop the door holder power after a certain period of time, whether it's no delay, 15 seconds, one minute, or five minutes. Uh, so your battery calculations don't have to be as large, uh, but you'll still have to take those into account. Uh, the battery connections, again, earlier, as mentioned, I like to mention this several times, operates 27.3 volts DC, and that's with or without a load. So with the batteries connected or disconnected, you should see right at 27.3 volts DC. Uh, batteries should be labeled sealed lead acid batteries. If your area has already adopted uh, newer editions of NFPA 72, just note that the nomenclature has changed for this. I think it says like enclosed lead acid batteries now. Uh, really, it means the same thing. It's just rewording it, to be honest. Uh, but just just note that that uh, the the naming structure for the batteries is changing with the 2019 edition of NMPA 72. Uh, the control panel enclosures will house two 12 amp hour batteries, but will not house 18 amp hour batteries. Uh, so again, it will house 12 amp hour batteries. Uh, panels will charge the 55 amp hour batteries. If you need uh, anything beyond the 12 amp hour batteries, uh, we do have battery enclosures that we sell as well. Uh, so you can just put a, a battery cabinet, you know, beside the control panel or below the control panel to house those. And complete battery calcs can be found on our website to determine battery size. And then, of course, NFPA 72 requires 24 min or 24 hours of standby power followed by five minutes of alarm activation. I'm going to pause here for a second for any questions that people may have. And also, I should say, to get a drink. So as far as uh, max amp hours that the, bat that the panel will support, again, will support up to 55 amp hour batteries but you'll have to get a separate battery cabinet for that. One of the things I should note is the fact that when utilizing different size batteries with our control panels, uh, it automatically adjusts for you, whether it's a seven amp hour, whether it's the 55 amp hour battery. Uh, so again, there's no selector switch. There's nothing in programming. Our panel will automatically identify what type of amp hour battery it is and then charge according to that battery size. All right, so moving on to the accessories. Uh, these are really those P-Link modules. And again, we have that uh, full wire, that, that data bus, that P-Link, or, or I should say RS-485 data bus. Uh, the current rating is one amp with a voltage rating of 24 volt DC. Maximum distance could be up to 6,500 feet. Doesn't mean you can always go 6,500 feet. Uh, we do have a P-Link distance calculator on our website. I will show you guys where to find the battery calculators and peeling distance calculators before I get off this webinar. Uh, so again, make sure you verify exactly how far you can go on that peeling circuit. Again, it will support up to 31 peeling modules and we're gonna get ready to cover all these peeling modules here in a second. Uh, wiring is fully supervised and power limited. First modules we have are, say, should say the standard modules that you may need for the 4064 uh, control panel. Uh, the, the first one is the dialer, the UD2000. 
uh, provides the ability for the panel to communicate via telephone lines. And then I'm gonna bring all this up. The next one is the uh, Class A card, so we can't do Class A with this. I'm sorry, I'm grabbing myself a drink. And then the other one is the six or the IDC six. It gives you six additional IDC circuits. Uh, so you can again expand that system up to 192 zones. Uh, like like I mentioned before, the the fact of if you go to expand to that many zones or conventional zones, I hope you move to an addressable panel. As far as installing these cards, uh, the first one we have here, and I apologize. Uh, have the naming wrong on it because we have the UD2000 now. This was our old dialer module, the UD1000, but it will install in the same spot. Uh, but you'll have the dialer card installed to the lower left-hand side. Then you have the expansion card installed up to the upper right-hand side. And then as far as Class A, again, you'll notice the Class A does Class A for P-Link and the notification circuits. It's gonna install to the lower right-hand side if utilizing Class A. If you're not utilizing the Class A system, you could put a different P-Link module card in the spot where the CA4064 is. Once you install these, you simply just put the panel board over the top of this, and it takes two screws that you see here up to the upper left-hand side and upper right-hand side uh, for that board. There's other P-Link module cabinets available, so if you do need these, uh, depending on how large your system's going to get, we have these expansion cabinets. We have the 82, the 8, and the 14. Two holds two cards, eight holds eight, and the 14 holds 14 cards, of course. As far as other P-Link modules, uh, as mentioned before, uh, we, we do have the two remote enunciators. Uh, and honestly, I should take this smaller one off, uh, but people still purchase it and buy it. But like I said before, uh, you know, most references in the code say that your remote enunciator is supposed to mimic the display of your file and control panel. And because this is a two by 16 character display and this file and control panel is a uh, four by 20, technically it would not mimic the display uh, because it doesn't use the same amount of characters or more. Whereas the 6500 will mimic the display and actually gives you a larger display. Uh, and as mentioned before, uh, it's actually about $8 cheaper, I believe, to order the larger display. Plus, not only does it come in red, it comes in options for black, dark gray, and light gray. Also, the 6500 comes in an option for a semi-flush format. Uh, and I say semi-flush because the door sticks off about half of an inch. Uh, so again, the 6500 actually gives you more flexibility anyway when it comes to color and whether or not to have it surface mounted or semi-flush. The 6075 is surface mount only and red only. Other P-Link modules, so we do have an LED 16, so just a 16 zone LED enunciator if you do need that. Uh, Again, most times people are probably gonna choose the actual readout display, unless you're in areas like Denver, Chicago, you know, some parts of Baltimore, things like that, where they still like the LED display. Uh, then we have our smart power supply. Uh, nice thing is about this power supply is the fact that it's rated up to 10 amps of power, has six notification circuits. These notification circuits can be programmed for multiple things, from your sync protocol to your door holder power to your constant or resettable power. Again, multiple ways to use those. In addition to that, the notification circuits on here can also be programmed from 2K to 27K for the EOL value. So if you're taking over an existing system, it makes it that much easier. Uh, it has two dry contact inputs. So basically it's two IDCs built in. And then it has an isolated P-Link repeater, which will give you additional distance or amperage on that P-Link circuit. So most of this is what I just got done talking about. So up to 6,500 feet between these PSO 1000 power supplies. 
uh, does come in with 10 amps of power again, which is spread between the six notification circuits. The two dry contact inputs on here. So the one thing to note about the dry contact inputs on the PSO 1000 power supply is the fact that you cannot use two wire smoke detectors on these dry contact inputs. Uh, you can do heat detectors, pull stations, tampers, water flow all day long, everything else besides two wire smoke detectors. Uh, can be connected in a class A or class B configuration. And the uh, difference between a PSN 1000 and a PSN 1000E is cabinet size. So the other thing is if you need additional uh, cabinet space for mounting purposes, order a PSN 1000E. It's about a $30 difference, I think, to get you the larger cabinet. And it gives you room to mount six of those stacker brackets or six P-Link module cards inside the cabinet itself. A uh, question here, whether or not the PSN 1000 is programmed via DIP switches, and it is not. So this has to be programmed through through the software via the software. Uh, yeah, cannot be programmed via DIP switches. So yeah, it has to be programmed through the software. And again, it does have that programmable EOL. Uh, so the nice thing about the programmable EOL on the PSN 1000 power supply is the fact that each one of these circuits could be a different value on here. Uh, meaning that you could have NAC1 as a 5.1K, NAC2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 could be 10K or 20K. Uh, so again, it's greater flexibility with the output circuits on the PSN 1000 power supply. And as far as synchronization on the power supply, yes, this will provide synchronization as well. And really what we say, it provides system-wide synchronization. Uh, so everything that's on the main control panel will sync up with every output on these power supplies. If you have 10 power supplies, it's gonna sync up to all 10 power supplies. The other, uh, I'll say a benefit of having these as smart power supplies versus conventional, it's all uh, done through the P-Link circuit for you. It's meaning that your supervision of the power supplies through the P-Link, your synchronization to the power supplies through the P-Link, and your activation of the power supply is through the P-Link. So everything is done through the P-Link. In addition to that, if you get a trouble on NAC circuit three on power supply two, you're gonna know on the control panel that it's NAC circuit three power supply two. Also, when it comes to ground fault detection, uh, it, it's pretty nice, the fact that it won't tell you the exact circuit on the power supply, but if you get a ground fault on, say, power supply number three, it's going to tell you, hey, you have a ground fault on power supply number three, uh, which, again, gets you closer to where your issue is. Again, it doesn't tell you the exact circuit, but at least tells you the power supply you have a ground fault on. Whereas a lot of conventional systems out there, it's going to tell you you have a ground fault and you just don't know where it's at. The next P-Link module is the MC-1000. Uh, this is used a lot, uh, we'll say in Texas. Uh, what this is mainly used for is garden style apartment scenarios. Uh, and if you're familiar with what those are, it's where you have a clubhouse kind of centered, and then you have apartment buildings that are all built around this clubhouse. A lot of times in that clubhouse, they'll have an addressable control panel. And then in the apartment buildings, they'll have a 4064 control panel because all the 4064 is doing is monitoring water flow, tamper, you know, maybe a smoke, a pulsation, things like that. So what the MC-1000 does, it allows those MC-1000, or sorry, the 4064 control panels, which are des designated as clients, to communicate to this MC-1000 module, which then communicates back to the host control panel, which is the addressable control panel. Then that host control panel is what sends everything off site or to the central station for reporting purposes. So really it gives you a way to, to share 
a single reporting technology, whether it's uh, uh, IP or not. Now, the one thing about the MC1000 module is if you're going to utilize this, we highly, or I should say, we strongly urge you to utilize IP reporting just because if you're going to use something else such as phone lines uh, or cellular communicator, a lot of times cellular communicators cannot uh, withstand, we'll say, the bandwidth uh, that we output. Uh, so what they'll do is they'll actually end up shutting down after so much communication. Uh, I believe it's a 500 megabyte or something like that. Uh, once a cellular communicator gets 500 meg, and it may be even smaller than that, uh, basically they'll just shut down the lockup and they have to be powered down, powered back up. So we always tell people if you're going to utilize the MC1000, utilize IP reporting from the host control panel. And if you're wondering what this is, uh, we actually just had a, a webinar on the MC1000 not too long ago. And we have a new section that's going to be coming up on our website called Past Webinars. Uh, we've been doing a, a series of specialized webinars every Wednesday at uh, 2 o'clock. We skipped this Wednesday. We're doing it next Wednesday now. But uh, we've had one over doing sounder-based programming. We had one over doing the MC1000. We had one for releasing. And the one we have next week is going to be dedicated for uh, talking about smoke control. But my point being is if you missed the previous webinars, we are gonna, we've added a past webinar section and we, re, we recorded all those webinars we've already been having. And that's supposed to be going live today. So again, we should have a past webinar section live today on our website for those previous webinars. Uh, the next PLink module is the DRV50. This gives you 50 independently configured LED outputs. Uh, so if, not sure if you guys ever walked into like a large network facility or data center, maybe even a government facility. They have a large graphical map. And on that graphical map, they have a bunch of LEDs. Each one of those LEDs represents a detector or module. Uh, and it's this DRV50 is what drives that graphical map or drives those LEDs. So that way, if that detector goes into alarm, then the LED lights on that map. So that way, the firefighters know exactly where to go to. The next one is the ROI5. Uh, what this gives you five independently configured relays. Uh, nice thing is about this, and I think I have the ratings on here. No. Uh, but the ratings are 3 amps up to 24 volt DC and 3 amps up to 125 volt AC. And again, they're form C contact relay. Uh, with this conventional system, this is where I would say, okay, uh, utilize this and you can do elevator recall. So you have different relays on this you know, for primary recall, alternate recall, shunt trip, and fireman's hat. And then, of course, a spare. Uh, so again, makes a very uh, simple process for doing elevator recall on that system. Uh, the other PLink modules, I'm just going to bring all these up at the same time. So the first one we have is the FCB1000. It's going to give you a remotely located Ethernet network connection. Uh, not used too often, but if you do plan to uh, report to the central station over IP, uh, what I would suggest doing is uh, using this module, and what you can do is instead of connecting to the first immediate network switch that you would normally go to, you can skip all those intermediate network switches, go straight to the main network rack, connect in there. And the reason why I say this is because by code, you're supposed to provide each one of those switches with battery backup for 24 hours or if approved by the AHJ, eight hours. So the reason why I'm saying utilize this module is because you can skip all those intermediate switches, go to the main network rack, which uh, a main network rack uh, is supposed to be backed up for eight hours anyway. Uh, the only reason why I know that's because my degree uh, is actually in network design 
in administration, and that's what they taught us in school, main network rack, eight hours, which I think is why NFPA 72 put the exception in there for eight hours. Uh, so if you can convince your AHJ for the eight hours, you should be good to go. Or at least you're only backing up that main network rack for 24 hours. Or uh, So again, it cuts down on some of the, the UPSs that you would have to purchase. Uh, then from there, we have the FIB 1000. It's going to convert that uh, four-wire P-Link bus to or from fiber optic cable. This utilizes multi-mode fiber only with an ST connector. Uh, so again, multi-mode fiber with an ST connector. This is going to be utilized if you have to go to an exterior building. Uh, makes it, you know, instead of doing copper, utilize fiber uh, because fiber is not as susceptible to lightning damage, or I should say is not susceptible to lightning damage whereas copper, as we know, is. Then the last one here, if you still see in the specs to uh, do a printer module, uh, we do have the SPG-1000, which provides you a serial or parallel printer interface. Of course, not a lot of people are providing printers nowadays, but just note, if you still see a spec out there, we have a printer module available. As far as P-Link addressing, I'll bring this up here. We have a different bucket of address available for each type of P-Link module. What we mean by this is the fact that you could have the remote enunciator addressed as one, the PS1000 power supply addressed as one, maybe even the ROI5 addressed as one. And the panel is going to know how to differentiate between each type of P-Link module. Uh, so... Again, really, it's it's the fact that I'm going to get on my pen here. If you have the same type of P-Link module, that's when you have to address it differently. So, for instance, if I had two remote enunciators, I would address this as one and two. But I could come down here, address the PS1000 power supply as one, address my Relay 5 as one, and I'm still good to go. Even if I had two Relay modules, I could still do this as one and two and have my remote enunciators as still one and two. And again, it still knows how to differentiate between them. And of course, all this is addressed using binary dip switches from one to 31. And if you're not familiar with binary dip switching, uh, we do have a little cheat sheet that comes with the, the modules, or I would say there's multiple apps out there for your smartphones. If you just look up, uh, you know, dip switch calculators uh, that can assist you. Get rid of my drawings here. As far as connecting up the P-Link circuit, again, it's very, very straightforward. It's A to A, B to B, plus to plus, minus to minus. And a lot of people ask, well, how do I exit from one P-Link device to the next one? You just put them under the same terminals to go out to the next P-Link device. Again, these terminals will accept up to 12 gauge cable, so there should be no issue of getting your, your circuits under the same terminals. I'm sure you're probably not using 12 gauge, you're probably using 14 or something like that, maybe 16, most likely. And then, of course, don't forget to set the address before you install those. Any questions over this section before I move on and take a couple seconds to grab a drink? So a good question and a tough question. Uh, how do you connect a voice panel to the system? Uh, with that, our voice panels, so if you're going to utilize a Potter voice, I'll say, it's going to be a through relay connection. So you're going to use the ROI5, and then you'll program those uh, relay cards to do your your activation of that voice panel so and i shouldn't say it's a tough question actually it's fairly easy if you think about it so again just using those roi fives uh, to program it and of course the only time it really gets interesting with voice is when you have to do like floor above floor below things like that uh, So moving on here, I know we're uh, we're getting close uh, 
probably another 15 minutes or so, I would say, uh, of this. Like I said, it takes about an hour for this presentation. Uh, so typical panel startup for the 4064 control panel is without a computer, this is what you're going to do. Install all of your devices, like how we have a pre-programmed, so water flow for input one, pull station for input three, et cetera. Run or learn via the control panel if you have any P-Link modules. Uh, program the panel via the 4064 keypad. And then test the system. Again, you can do full programming via the keypad. It's just we highly suggest doing it via a laptop. If you're going to do it with the computer, which is the recommended method, install the software on your laptop, and I'll show you where to get the software here in a second. Install all of the devices uh, on whatever IDCs that you want. Run the learn via the control panel for any P-Link modules you have connected. Upload the programming to the computer. Customize the program. And then download the program into the 4064 control panel, then of course test the system and send it out to the central station. As far as that connection, there's two different types of connection. There's a direct connection and a network connection. Uh, and as mentioned before, and I'm going to pick on this guy because he's my coworker. He must not be listening to very well, uh, so I laugh about it. But as mentioned before, as far as the programming, again, uh, while we have those pre-programmed zones, again, it, you do not have to follow that pre-programmed uh, zone. So I'm going to back up here. So what he's talking about really is this. Again, we have this pre-programmed for the devices like shown here on the screen. Uh, you do not have to follow this. Again, if you're doing a small little, uh, you know, water monitoring or water flow monitoring system, this is probably what you could get away with. But if we get into a larger system, of course, modify this to however you want. Uh, so yes, you do not have to follow this, but if you're doing a small system, I highly suggest following this because it makes it easier on you. Uh, so again, the connections here, the first one is a direct connection. Uh, the nice thing is about this connection is you can use a pass through or a crossover cable or i should say a straight through or crossover cable uh, so we will accept either we get that question a lot and any cable you pretty much have is going to work uh, once you're connected up you should see it come up on the screen saying obtaining ip private ip and it should flash eventually potter's private ip address of the 169.254.150.70 uh, this IP address is the same IP address that's used on all of our control panels across the board, whether it's the addressable control panels or conventional. We utilize the same private IP address. Here's just kind of a glimpse at the software. Like I said before, with this 4064 webinar, we don't go into detail for the uh, software. Uh, but... We just kind of give you a glimpse. Again, the software is pretty straightforward. Uh, one thing I will say about this, again, we do have the software webinar coming up, which will help you or will assist you with setting up or navigating through the software. Uh, if you're attending that tomorrow, uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. If you found that tomorrow's already booked up, we do have another one coming up here uh, in a week or two. Or what I will do is I'll show you a, a couple other ways too, as far as uh, getting the most out of the Ford 64 training. I'm gonna show you our training videos on the website. Uh, just in case you haven't seen them, we do have some specific 4064 training videos. And I'm gonna keep going here. I know it's questions. If you guys do have questions, again, please feel free to type those into the chat box. Uh, the other ones with that PCOM network connection, uh, again, the other one's a network connection, so you go through the customer's switch or network equipment. Uh, the IP address can be actually be set two different ways, so you can have it set up as DHCP, which is the default, or set up as a static IP address. With that being said, uh, DHCP, if you don't know the difference between the two, is going to go out and look for an IP address, and there's a 
a host computer uh, or switch that's going to assign an IP address to that control panel. Now, the difference with a DHCP is the fact that once that IP address is assigned, that IP address could change. It could change in the next hour. It could change tomorrow, next month, next year. You don't know when it's going to change, but it's going to change at some point in time. With a static IP address, it's going to remain that IP address indefinitely until you physically change it again. And then this was just showing the fact that when we connect it to a network, it comes up with the network IP address now. And a lot of people ask, what's the easiest way to find the IP address on a control panel? Unplug the cable and plug it back in. It's going to flash it up on the screen for you. Uh, that's the easiest way to find the IP address. With that network connection, it gives you the ability to upload or download the configuration file through the network. You've established your communication to the central station. And then all now you're also ready to send and receive emails. Uh, so again, for free, we give you the option to be able to send and receive emails through the panel. When you're uploading and downloading, it gives you the option to use the unique uh, NetBIOS or IP address. Uh, we always recommend people just utilizing the IP address, but we do like to show people where the NetBIOS is just so that we have an understanding of it. So the NetBIOS is the unique, we'll say, serial number of that control panel. Uh, so what I have here on your screen is circled is the NetBIOS. Uh, it always starts out with the type of control panel it is, whether it's PFC 4064, or whether it's an AFC 50, AFC 1000, et cetera. The other barcode sticker that you guys see there that's not circled is actually the MAC address of the control panel. So if you guys were ever to install a control panel at a site and the network administrator said, hey, I need to know the MAC address of that control panel, easiest way to find it is that barcode sticker right there. So again, one barcode sticker is the type of control panel, which is the NetBIOS. The other barcode sticker is the MAC address of the control panel. Again, the IP address can be found in System Tools menu, Ethernet status, or like I said, unplug the cable and plug it back in, and it's going to flash it up on the screen for you. Email setup. So again, all the 4064, just like all the other Potter control panels, come with built-in email. It's pretty easy to set up. Uh, it's basically just that NetBIOS name at PotterLink.com. So for instance, if I had a 4064 and it was NetBIOS ending 1005, it's going to show up like this at PotterLink.com. So out of the box, ready to send and receive emails. Up to 20 different recipients can be entered into the program at any time. And using the software, you can configure which emails can be sent to each email address, such as status emails, history reports, even test signals. Also, utilizing that software, you can configure who can receive information on demand. Uh, what we mean by this is we actually give you the ability to email the control panel, and it will email you back with information such as, as, again, status reports, history reports, even the full software configuration file. Uh, so again, you can actually email the control panel and ask for information on demand. And I'll go over how to, as far as all this email reporting and things like that, again, I go over how to set all this up uh, in the software webinar. Status emails can be alarm, supervisor, or trouble conditions. They can be sent when the condition occurs, and they may or may not contain more than one event. It all depends on how close the events were to one another. So uh, normally what it is, if you have multiple events in less than 10 seconds, they're all going to be on the same email. If they're greater than 10 seconds apart, then they're going to be on separate emails. Biggest thing about these, because... Uh, uh, I kind of laughed to myself, but people always ask, can I use this to alert the authorities? Can I use this to send to the uh, you know, fire department myself and skip the central station? No, 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 no. This is not intended to alert the authorities. This is just an extra function.
so again, you still need to report to Central Station. History reports can be scheduled as daily, weekly, or monthly. It can be attached to the email as either a text file or Excel file, and they're very small in spot, small in size. A lot of people worry that uh, they're going to have too much bandwidth to them. It's not the case. I mean, they're kilobytes of information. They don't even get up to the one meg. They're probably like 500 kilobytes, a half of meg at, the, at that. Uh, so about a typical email size, I would say. Up to eight different scheduled emails can be in the system from yearly all the way down to daily. You can include a custom message with this, uh, such as, hey, annual test inspections due in the next week, please contact ABC company to set up an appointment uh, or battery replacement, warranty expiration, multiple things you guys could have set up. Uh, you can include a history or status email with those. And it could be sent to, this could be sent up to 20 different recipients' email addresses with a total of 40 email addresses being able to be stored in the program at any given time. And those email reminders are great for, again, annual test reminders, battery replacement, warranty expiration, and customer appreciation marketing. What I mean by that, it could be a simple, uh, you know, happy new year from ABC company. Uh, not only do we do fire alarm systems, or I should say happy new year from ABC company, uh, Hope you have a great year. Uh, you know, contact us if there's anything else you need done. Not only do we do fire alarm systems, we also do access control, security, you know, uh, fire protection, things like that. So they may not know that you do multiple other avenues as well. So it's a good way just to kind of get your other sources of income or sources of business out there. And on the screen, you see here's the, the one we have as an example for annual test and inspection. So just a simple, you know, hey, you know, test inspection to contact so-and-so to set up an appointment. The last little screen we have here is for the FMT or facility management tool software. This will allow you to connect up to 255 Potter control panels from anywhere in the world, utilizing the LAN, WAN, or internet, of course. Uh, this is a free software. Uh, what you do with it is completely up to you, but you can remotely view, sort, print uh, those system events. Uh, nice thing is it allows you to export these to either Excel or Word documents as well. There also is a keypad emulation, as you see on the screen, that allows you to remotely interact with the system event buffer, uh, meaning that you can sit there and cycle through the history just as if you're standing in front of the control panel. Now, one thing is, if you're going to use the FMT, we recommend, or I should say, we we inform you that you should set up a static IP address in your control panel. Because what happens is the FMT is looking for a specific IP address, and if that IP address changes, then it doesn't know that the IP address in your control panel changed. Uh, so it doesn't know where to route to or where to connect to. So again, if you're going to utilize the FMT, make sure you put uh, a static IP address in your control panel. And if you want to know more information about the FMT, we do have video on our website, where, which I'm going to show you where all, the, all of our videos are here in a second. I would say watch the video, get a little more knowledge about it. If you still have questions beyond that, you can contact uh, either technical support or training or even your local sales representative. And if you guys have questions, now's a good time to ask those. Otherwise, I'm going to do a little uh, a closing here. And then again, I'm going to bring open our website and show you where to find some of the information on our website. Uh, so again, a little overview. Six IDC circuits. Uh, if Class B, three Class A IDCs, expand up to 192. Comes with that 5-amp power supply. Four notification circuits can be programmed for multiple things, especially those sync circuits. Uh, one programmable aux power circuit, the four configurable relays, uh, which again can map it to different IDCs if you want. Multiple ways those can be programmed. That P-Link RS-45 that connects to all those uh, system accessory cards. The built-in Ethernet port, which again you can upload or download to and from the control panel 
or it's also listed as a sole path communicator to the central station. Also utilizes those email capabilities, which we just got done talking about. Control panel has that four by 20 character display. It is programmable via the laptop, which is where we, what we recommend, or again, keypad programmable. I want to thank you guys for attending this. Uh, I did record this webinar, just so you know. Uh, this is going to go up in our past webinar section uh, once I convert the recording and finish up some things with it. Again, if you guys have questions, please feel free to contact tech support at the email address or phone number shown on the screen or contact training, which is training at pottersignal.com. Uh, for now, I'm going to exit out of this. I'm going to open up our website and show you where to find the battery calculations and just a couple other things about our website. So if we get rid of this. So again, pottersignal.com, which we all know how to get there, I assume. One of the first things I'll show you because uh, you may be buying through distribution for this 4064 is I always like to show people how to navigate and find their local sales representative. Uh, to do this up here at the top of the screen, you'll see this contact button. If you click that and then scroll down, you'll see the numbers for tech support, customer service, things like that. But keep scrolling down. You're going to find a map of the U.S. And this is where you can find uh, where to find your local sales rep. So, for instance, if you're in the Southern California area, which I believe is, uh, I forget where the cutoff is, but if you contact the wrong person, they're going to get you in touch with the right person. But uh, Basically, you're going to contact Mark Sandler. You'll see his phone number here on the screen. Click the email. It'll bring up his email. Or again, if you're in Florida, that's going to be Kevin McGoon. Maybe you're in the, the southeast with uh, Derek Jenkins. Again, cell numbers, email addresses are all on here. Contact one of our sales reps. Uh, they'll be more than willing to assist or help you. And the same goes if you guys do fire protection, sprinkler. Look at our sales map over there too. Contact one of our sales reps for that. So the next thing I want to show you guys is uh, for our uh, battery calculations. And again, if you guys do have questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box. Uh, so as far as battery calculations, to find that, you go to Documents and Resources, Resource Type, Go to calculator, then click the green Get Documents button, and you're going to see all the battery calculations for all of our uh, control panels. So if I scroll down, I should see the 4064 in here somewhere. Oh, there it is. Just looking over. So yeah, it's right here in the middle. So if you have a calculator for that, uh, then beyond that, like I said, uh, training videos. So if you go to training, then training videos, we have multiple videos here. And since we just got done with the 4064 one, we'll click this button, and it's going to take you directly to the 4064 uh, videos. Now the the way we did this is we did these videos. I know several people were asking about uh, keypad programming. So these videos are actually all set up to do some of the basic keypad programming. You know, how to set up points, zones, and pro, uh, dialer programming via the keypad. And of course, the notification circuits for uh, the one person that was asking about doing uh, notification through the, the keypad. So again, these are all set up for keypad programming if that's the route you want to take. And of course, there's several other videos on here as well when it comes to uh, our library. Other webinars coming up. So we do have other webinars. I believe the hardware and software webinar for this week, if you have not already registered, is full. Uh, but we do have other hardware and software webinars coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, 
I do have another 4064 webinar coming up. Uh, again, ask the trainer webinars. These are kind of specific. Uh, so even if you attended all of our other webinars, uh, continuously get on uh, our website and look for new Ask the Trainers coming up. Uh, in addition to that, if there's a specific topic that you guys would like us to talk about, feel free to email training and we can do an Ask the Trainer over your specific topic or over multiple topics, depending on how long we think the topic will last. A lot of times these Ask the Trainer webinars only last about 15 to 20 minutes, uh, but the goal is to, to get on there and uh, figure out, I shouldn't say figure out, but to answer a lot of the issues that people normally are having troubles with out in the field. So it's just to try and make things clear for people or simplify things when it comes to very specific topics. And again, eventually, it's not up here yet. Hopefully, it will be later today. But you will see on the same page, there's going to be another button here that's going to say past webinars. And that way, you can view the videos of all of our past webinars, uh, whether it's our PotterNet, whether it's the MC1000, Sounder-based webinar, et cetera, or even our releasing uh, webinar that we just got done with. So if there's no other... Uh, uh, questions, uh, there's another question. Uh, so I think someone's asking about the hardware webinar. Uh, so I'll just scroll this up. So this is the times, they're asking what time the next webinar starts. So it's one o'clock central time today, if that's the one you're referring to, or the software webinar on uh, tomorrow, it's gonna be 9 a.m. as well. So if there's no other questions, uh, again, I want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, I will stick around for an additional 10 minutes just in case people do have questions. Otherwise, feel free to go. The only thing I'll say is, you know, stay safe out there. Look forward to seeing you guys in a live training at some point in time. I can't wait to get back out in front of people. That's, that's what I enjoy.